Good morning, everybody. I'm Alcus Price from the Harvard School of Public Health, and I'm going to talk about uh, functional interpretation of hidden heritability. Uh, I'd like to start with a brief introduction to heritability in GWAS. As Joel mentioned, uh, the heritability of height, uh, using height as an example, was estimate, has been estimated for a long time at around 0.8, but the 2010 giant study, the 180 loci it identifies, explain only about 10% of the variance of height. That gap has long been known as the mystery of the missing heritability, and there's a similar story for other traits and diseases. Now, in a landmark paper of Ying et al. 2010, Nature Genetics, from Peter Vischer's group, they use variance components methods to estimate the heritability explained by all genotype SNPs, not just those that are genome-wide significant. And they estimated the heritability explained by genotype SNPs, or H squared G, at about 45%, putting a major dent in the mystery of the missing heritability. So by way of terminology, uh, I'm going to refer to the gap between 0.45 and 0.8. That's the heritability that's still unaccounted for and still missing. I'm going to refer to that as missing heritability. On the other hand, the gap between 0.1 and 0.45, or now 0.16 to 0.45, as Joel mentioned, uh, that's a heritability that's hiding somewhere on the genotyping chip, or at least tagged by the genotyping chip. We know it's there. We just don't know exactly where it is. I'm going to refer to that as hidden heritability. So the outline of this talk will be as follows. First, I will give a brief review of some recent published work on uh, functional annotations and GWAS data. And then I will describe some of our group's work on uh, functional interpretation of hidden heritability using both raw genotype data as input or using summary association statistics as input. So starting with a review of some recent work, uh, everybody, of course, in this audience will be familiar with the uh, landmark ENCODE 2012 paper, which was able to assign biochemical functions to 80% of the genome. Uh, a couple recent perspective articles from Mujidal and Kallis et al. have pointed out that there's still a lot of work to do because we still don't know what percentage of the genome is truly functional. So some of the work uh, initially focusing on genome-wide significant SNPs, well, initially, of course, the focus was on coding regions. Hindorf et al. showed that uh, while coding SNPs are obviously very enriched in uh, genome-wide significant hits from GWAS, they only uh, occupy about 11% of those SNPs, and that has uh, motivated pretty much everybody to have a focus these days on non-coding variation. Uh, subsequently, a paper of Nikolai et al. 2010, as well as some other papers, show that you do get a small but very statistically significant enrichment in GWAS hits looking at EQTLs, uh, you know, gene expression associated SNPs. Uh, a very important paper of Monal 2012 showed that if you look at the DNA's 1 hypersensitivity sites, which are, uh, of course, markers of regulatory potential, then uh, you do see an enrichment of about 1.4 fold of uh, those SNPs being enriched in GWAS hits, and that increases to 1.8 if you include SNPs that perfectly tag DHS SNPs. And then, uh, as, as all of you, of course, know, a lot of this uh, architecture is cell type specific. And the paper of Trinket all 2013, for example, uh, showed that GWAS hits for several, several common diseases are enriched in H3K4ME3 hits in a cell type specific fashion. So a lot of this initial work was focusing on genome-wide significant SNPs from GWAS. Uh, more recently, people have started to be interested in the heritability approach. Uh, initially, the Yang et al. 2011 paper, just looking at genic versus non-genic regions in height. Uh, then Lead al. 2012, looking at CNS plus gene regions. That's uh, genes involved in the central nervous system for schizophrenia. And then more recently, some interesting work uh, with quite large enrichment for heritability of both Tourette syndrome and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, looking at a parietal lobe, parietal lobe EQTL. So this is just a, a snapshot of some of the work that's been done. Of course, many other papers that I haven't mentioned. And I do also want to say, even though this is not a focus of this talk, that functional enrichment can be useful for increasing power in association studies. A few recent very interesting papers on that topic, including uh, one by Pickerel just published in HHG. So uh, moving on to some of our group's work, uh, starting with uh, functional interpretation using raw genotype data. This work uh, was led by Sasha Gusev in our group, the papers on bioarchives. Some of you may have heard Sasha speak on this bio of genomes. So for, for our sort of our initial experiments, we did something pretty simple, and that's just partition the genome into six pretty simplistic annotations, coding UTR promoter, DHS intron, and intergenic. Now you may be thinking that these categories are not naturally disjoint. We forced them to, to be disjoint by assigning SNPs to the first category on the list. For example, a SNP that's both, both promoter and DHS would be assigned to promoter under this scheme. 
So uh, now we're going to do something with heritability. Well, what, what is heritability? What is heritability explained by genotype SNPs? I'd like to provide a definition of that. So if you're just talking about one functional category, the genome as a whole, I'm going to define heritability explained by genotype SNPs as the maximum R squared to phenotype phi that you can obtain with any linear combination of genotyped SNPs. And it turns out that that, generalization, that that definition naturally generalizes to considering multiple functional categories. If you perform a joint fit on all the weights, then you can ask uh, how much of the uh, variance is explained by the summoned from each respective functional category. So that's a definition. It's, and it's a, a definition of a quantity that's defined in the whole entire population. Then we can talk about an estimation procedure in a finite sample. And we can ask questions like, does the estimation procedure pr provide unbiased estimates or does it not? And uh, the, uh, the estimation procedure procedure that uh, I'm mostly going to focus on for the next few minutes is the variance components method. It's popularized uh, for one variance component, again, by the paper of Yang et al. 2010, Nature Genetics. And this can be generalized to multiple variance components, whereby for each functional category F, we can define a, 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 geno, a, a genetic relationship matrix. This is an N by N matrix, where N is the number of samples, just uh, indicating how similar two individuals are uh, in terms of their normalized genotypes at each set of SNPs specific to each functional annotation. We take those genetic relationship matrices specific to each functional category and fit variance components for each one uh, using maximum likelihood or restricted maximum likelihood to estimate variance components. And then the ratios of the variance components uh, give us the uh, heritability explained by genotype SNPs in each functional category in the natural way. So uh, this is an estimation procedure which might produce unbiased estimates in some instances or biased estimates in others. We did torture test this approach pretty heavily in simulations. You can find the details of some of our most extreme torture tests in the paper. On this slide, I'm just presenting the simplest simulations which do provide unbiased estimates. So in the left half of the slide, we have some null simulations where the true enrichment is one fold for each of the annotation classes. And indeed, the variance component method uh, infers about one fold enrichment for every class. In the right half of this slide, we've simulated true enrichment with all of the heritability, all the causal SNPs lying in one of the annotations in this case DHS, and you can see that, you know, despite complexities of LD between SNPs lying in different classes, which is uh, obviously a very pervasive phenomenon, nonetheless, the multiple variance components uh, approach is able to accurately estimate 100% uh, of the heritability coming from DHS in this simulation. So enough about simulations. I'd like to move on to some real results. So these are results based on 11 traits from Welcome Trust and Welcome Trust 2. As it so happens, uh, six of the 11 traits are autoimmune diseases by chance, and that will be relevant, as I'll discuss in a moment. And we didn't just use genotype SNPs in the analyses portrayed on this slide. We actually used genotype and imputed SNPs using about 4 million SNPs from 1,000 genomes. So the main result you can see is that amongst these six categories, the heritability uh, explained by SNPs in these categories, both genotype and imputed, is totally dominated by DHS SNPs, which uh, in our annotations form 16% of the SNPs, but explain about 80% of the heritability, 5.1-fold enrichment. This is hugely statistically significant, leading to a fairly small standard error. And this is meta-analyzed across the 11 traits. For each trait considered individually at the sample sizes we analyze, the standard errors are quite large. So this is the meta-analysis across all traits, a huge enrichment for DHS. Now, Perhaps even more interesting that what we found for DHS is what we didn't find. If you look in intronic and intergenic regions, the last rightmost two columns of this plot, you can see we really didn't find hardly anything in intronic and intergenic regions. The p-values are saying that they are significantly depleted, that the enrichment factor is significantly different from 1x. But, but they're actually very close to zero and not significantly different from zero. This is saying that for this specific set of traits, there's virtually no signal at all as far as we can see, in intronic and intergenic regions after using a variance components approach to tease apart the LD between regions. One final note, you'll see coding on the far left. Of course, it's only 1% of the genome. It is the most enriched at 13.8x, but because it's only 1% of the genome, it doesn't explain that much of the heritability. So uh, one thing we tried is we asked, well, what if we hadn't used imputed SNPs? What if we just used the genotype SNPs? So the right half of this plot is the same as what you saw in the previous uh, slide, but now the left half is just restricting to genotype SNPs. You can see the signal is still there, but much, much, much weaker if you restrict the genotype SNPs. Presumably what's going on here is you have some ca causal coding or DHS SNPs, for example, that are best tagged by SNPs in the intronic or intergenic 
category. And some of the heritability leaks in the inter, into the intertronic, intronic or intergenic category, which is why we believe it's important to include imputed SNPs in this type of analysis if you want to get the strongest possible signal. Now, you might be wondering, you might be wondering what, what, what would you find if you just looked at uh, genome-wide significant SNPs? And so we looked at that. If you look at SNPs that are genome-wide significant in just the data that we analyzed, it's totally flat, 0.9x, no enrichment whatsoever. If you kind of ramp that up a bit to looking at uh, SNPs that are genome-wide significant for these traits in the whole entire NHGRI catalog, then you do get a bit more enrichment, 1.7x, but that's still a whole lot lower than 5.1x. The 1.7x is pretty similar to what was previously reported in the uh, Murano et al. paper, albeit with a different set of DHS annotations. Now, you may be wondering, well, okay, instead of just looking at genome-wide significant SNPs, maybe we could sort of relax our p-value thresholds and look at SNPs, you know, maybe not, less than, not at a p less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8, but, you know, with a p less than a more relaxed threshold. And we looked at this, and these results are quite startling. In fact, I didn't believe them when I initially saw them, but we've now uh, duplicated this both in simulations and in real data. And what's going on here uh, in simulations, we've actually simulated causal DHS SNPs to explain the great bulk of the heritability. But then you look at the p-value enrichments, and you hardly see any signal at all, much weaker than, than just about all the other categories. And the reason for this, interestingly, is that DHS SNPs have substantially lower LD than SNPs in other categories due to their higher recombination rate in those regions, which is something that we're investigating in its own right. But due to, that different, due to those different LD properties, uh, it so happens that for regulatory SNPs, you don't actually get much of a signal, either in simulations or in real data, when you uh, employ the p-value enrichment approach, at least uh, in this analysis of these particular traits and data sets. So getting back to autoimmune traits, I mentioned earlier, six of the 11, just by chance, six of the 11 traits are autoimmune traits. It's, it so happens uh, just by chance. And the signal that we observed was larger for the autoimmune traits. It was over five and a half times if, uh, DHS enrichment for the autoimmune traits, while closer to a bit more than three times enrichment for the non-autoimmune traits. So we definitely see a stronger signal of enrichment for uh, autoimmune traits, and the difference is statistically significant. Now, the, uh, this uh, plot, you'll see results for each individual trait, and you can see that especially in the imputed analysis, the standard errors are quite large for each individual trait. For each individual trait, this analysis is telling you very little because the standard errors are so large. It's only in the meta-analysis where you have interesting conclusions. I note that you'll see that some of the point estimates uh, uh, this is for DHS. Some of the point estimates lie outside the plausible zero-one bound. And how did we deal that? Well, we, we applied sort of the standard approach that's used in the gene expression literature, for example, right at all 2014 Nature Genetics, whereby we meta-analyzed results without clipping. That is to say, allowing estimates to lie outside this, the zero-one bound, even though it's implausible, to allow for unbiased meta-analysis estimates, which is a, a standard approach. So uh, a couple of sub-analyses uh, that we did to sort of uh, further sub-partition the DHS annotations. Uh, we looked at enhancer annotations from the Hoffman et al. 2013 paper from Anolis Callis' group uh, using uh, Chrome HMM, and we found that the, uh, in, the DHS annotations that are also enhancers are substantially more enriched than uh, the overall uh, baseline DHS. We also looked at cell type specific DHS. Uh, we defined cell type specific as uh, DHS annotated in a total of two or fewer cell types. And those cell type specific DHS were slightly but significantly more enriched than the DHS baseline. So on this slide, uh, we, looked at, we looked for particular tissue types where uh, 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 cell type specificity in those tissue types produce a signal for the union of all autoimmune diseases. And again, we use the union of, of all autoimmune diseases because we, we felt we didn't have enough signal uh, when just looking at uh, one disease alone at these sample sizes. And you can see we, saw, uh, we found a bunch of uh, tissue types that were statistically significant after correcting for the multi uh, for multiple hypothesis tested, and four of those actually were just uh, replicating previous observations of Trinca et al. and Morana et al. Uh, there was one trait in which we actually did have the opportunity to analyze raw genotypes in large sample size, and that trait was schizophrenia. I didn't put it on the slide, but it's about 60,000 samples. This is from the PGC Consortium, and this is the, uh, the, the PGC2 paper that's about to be published on, uh, online in Nature next week. So about 60,000 schizophrenia samples, including cases and controls. Pleasingly, we saw that results were pretty similar to the Welcome Trust 2 schizophrenia data at much sm uh, smaller sample size, except as indicated in red, our standard error for this trait is now, of course, much lower due to the larger sample size. So DHS and of about three in schizophrenia with a quite tight bound in this large sample set. Uh, 
uh, we looked at another data set in which we happen to have both raw genotype, uh, you know, GWAS chip data as well as exome chip data, and we found that the inclusion of exome chip data didn't change things very much. So if you're worried about uh, rare coding variants, at least at the allele frequency on the exome chip, changing the analysis, it really didn't seem to change things very much. And indeed, we didn't really infer very much heritability at all, uh, at least in terms of statistical significance, coming from uh, rare coding variants on the exome chip, uh, and that's pretty much consistent with some recent work of Purcell et al. So one final point, uh, uh, this is not very surprising, but uh, of course, uh, one uh, way in which functional enrichment can be useful is in fine mapping. So using uh, priors uh, on functional enrichment information can greatly improve the efficacy of fine mapping. This table is sort of a, a best case scenario in which the enrichments are actually equal to what we observed in the meta-analysis of all traits and uh, assuming that they're inferred with perfect, that the enrichments are inferred with perfect accuracy. Under those circumstances, you can get a substantial reduction in the 95 5% credible SNP set for fine mapping for these traits for which publicly, publicly available uh, imputed summary statistics have been released. And so, not surprisingly, uh, there is a win for fine mapping, although we just used the, the sort of Mahler 2012 nature genetics approach without really uh, considering uh, work for multiple causal variants, which is in progress from other research groups. So in the limited time that I have left, uh, I'd like to just switch here just a little bit and talk about, well, what if the uh, type of input that you're analyzing is not raw genotype data, but is instead summary association statistics? So why the focus on summary association statistics? Well, mainly because they're very widely available. So in this 2012 editorial Nature Genetics de decree that anybody who wants to publish a GWAS in their journal, you've got to publicly release the summary association statistics. That means that there's a whole lot of publicly available summary association statistics. And you can see there's been a lot of interest in that type of data in, in recent work on rare variant association tests, as well as being able to impute thousand genomes uh, summary statistics from summary statistics at smaller subsets of SNPs. A secondary reason why there's an appeal of summary statistics is that as data sets get sufficiently large, if you have really large uh, raw genotype data sets going up to maybe 100,000 samples, then the variance components analysis can start to become computationally intractable. So for the really large data sets of the future, summary statistics may be more appealing. Now this is the exact same slide I showed earlier. Uh, in indicating that at least in the case of DHS, which have perhaps differential LD patterns, the approach of uh, the, uh, using p-value enrichment may, uh, in some instances, not in some instances not not sort of produce all of the signal that may be available for this type of analysis. So we were interested to investigate other methods for dealing with summary association statistics and functional enrichment, and uh, we settled on the approach of LD score regression. This work is jointly led by Hilary Finucane in our group and Brendan Bullock Sullivan and Ben Neal's group. Now, the LD score regression approach involves regressing uh, chi-squared association statistics for target SNPs against uh, multilinear regression, regressing that against uh, the target SNPs LD to multiple different functional categories. This is sort of a, a generalization of some initial uh, uh, work. Uh, so this is all sort of based on the idea that uh, an average chi-squared statistic greater than one does not imply confounding. So if you go back several years, you talk about GWAS with average chi-squared greater than one or lambda GC greater than one, people really worried about confounding. But now in the year 2014, an average chi-squared greater than one is not necessarily indicative of confounding. It it could just be to could be due to polygenicity if you're looking at a study with a very large sample size. So our, our initial work on uh, LD score regression, uh, which is a paper that's available on BioArchive by Bullock Sullivan et al., this is using LD score regression not for the purpose of inferring component heritability, but rather for distinguishing polygenicity from confounding. And the way this works, this is before we get to functional annotations, we've just got you know one uh, functional category which is the whole genome, and we regress uh, a target SNPs chi-scored association statistics against that SNPs LD score defined as its LD with itself and all the other SNPs in the, in the genome, the sum of the R squareds. And in that regression, well, if you see a slope, the slope is indicative of polyge polygenic signal, because if you have polygenicity, the amount of signal you see to SNP should be on average in proportion to the amount of LD it has, and, you know, number of causal SNPs that it might tag, speaking crudely. But if you see a positive intercept, a residual intercept could be indicative of confounding. And so in this approach, uh, in, in the bullock solvenal paper, we focus on using the intercept to distinguish polygenic from confounding. But now in our ongoing work, we're more interested in using a slope to get at heritability. If you just have a single component, then the slope, suitably scaled with respect to the sample size n and the number of SNPs m, gives you an estimate of the heritability explained by genotype SNPs. Now you can generalize that to multiple functional categories, run a multi-linear regression against the LD scores specific to SNPs in each respective functional category, and then take those at slopes suitably scaled to give you estimates of heritability explained by SNPs in each respective functional category. We've done that 
that, uh, again, I, I don't have time to show all the simulations. We've torture tested it. We have identified instances where small biases are present. I'm not going to show you all of that. But the good news is that if we go back to the welcome trust traits analyzed in the Goose Fidel bioarchive paper, we did see pretty similar results, for example, uh, for DHS, as in the variance component analysis. And uh, now we've also started looking at some uh, other uh, marks, such as histone modifications. And perhaps the more interest most interesting result involves uh, that we've uh, been able to obtain so far involves phantom 5 enhancers, uh, published by Anderson all 2014, using cage analysis. And there, even though those annotations only span 0.4% of the genome, they seem to explain in this uh, data about 13% of the heritability, a whopping 29-fold enrichment, which is highly statistically significant. So in progress, uh, we're working on uh, applying this method to many different traits for which we have summary statistics available in large sample size on the order of 40,000 to 70,000 samples. And of course, uh, now, that we, now that we're talking about an individual trait with a large sample size, there's a lot we can do with that. We're no longer you know, terrified to death of the large standard errors. We can look at individual traits. We can potentially draw inferences about individual traits, even maybe delving into cell type specific analyses for individual traits. So conclusions. Um, the first conclusion is that variance components methods seem to provide a robust way to partition hidden heritability across functional categories when you are so lucky as to have raw genotype data available. And I'm sure this will be no surprise to all of you that most of the uh, heritability explained by genotype SNPs does seem to be hiding in regulatory regions, which are often cell type specific. The second conclusion is that uh, analyses that do not include imputed SNPs or analyses that restrict a genome-wide significant SNPs or p-value enrichments. Now, these, there's no question that these types of analyses have generated really interesting and important conclusions. However, these may uh, not yield the maximum possible amount of signal, especially in the case of regulatory variation, which uh, in the DHS annotations we looked at harbor lower LD due to higher recombination. And if there's folks out there who are you know, generating new and exciting interesting annotations and are interested to connect those annotations to an interpretation involving real phenotypes, and I know you folks are out there because I've been talking to you at this conference, uh, you may wish to consider uh, a variance components analysis using imputed SNPs as part of the arsenal with which you could attack that problem. Uh, finally, in the instance in which raw genotype is not available, but only summary association statistics are available, we have been exploring the LD score regression approach, which seems to provide a promising route to partitioning hidden heritability in that context, enabling analyses of individual diseases in very large sample size. This is the work of many people. Thank you. So we have time for questions, so please come up to the microphones. So I, I was pretty struck by this uh, remarkable enrichment of the uh, phantom enhancers. So uh, I'm curious, how does that compare to your DHS annotations? And uh, because I, I sort of lost track as to sort of where is this, where's the baseline for this? So the, 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 the 29-fold enrichment is not relative to DHS. It's relative to a sort of overall baseline. So 0.1, after accounting for rounding error, 0.132 divided by 0 0.004 comes out to 29. So this is just, uh, so if you like, it's, it's almost six times more enriched than DHS. Now, granted, you know, you're talking about 0.4% of the genome rather than 16% of the genome. You would kind of expect that if, you, if you're going to winnow 16% of the genome down to 0.4% of the genome, I mean, it, it, it would be a tragedy if you didn't get, have the enrichment be at least somewhat higher. So in that sense, the, the fact that you're seeing a much higher enrichment may correspond to the fact that you're winnowing down to a much, much, much smaller proportion of the genome. I'm also curious as to the way that these were described has to do with transcription. So, um, you know, these are just extremely highly transcribed, short intergenic fragments. So I'm just wondering if there's any potential genes there or any sort of different classes of elements. So the, the, I guess you're asking about the, the connection between uh, the SNPs in these annotations and corresponding genes. And I think that that is a really fascinating and really important question. And I know that there are currently people looking at it. We are not currently looking at it because, well, we're trying to get some other things in gear first. We're certainly interested to look at it. It's certainly a critically important question. I know that the Anderson et al. paper makes some claims about their annotations being particularly amenable to connecting their annotations to corresponding genes. I am not personally qualified to evaluate those claims. I know the paper makes those claims. Maybe they're true. I don't know. 
So the, lastly, you mentioned that they cover 13% of the heritability. What was the fraction that you get for the DHS? The uh, for DHS, uh, it's about 80%, 79%. Oh, I see. So, so certainly, a... you're losing a lot by going from 16% of the genome to 0.4% of the genome. You're losing most of it, but because you've winnowed down to such a minuscule fraction of the genome, the, the enrichment is higher. And you know, in a, in a way, there may be a little bit of an analog here to what Joel was talking about, whereby you know you can have SNPs with that you know you can have you can have SNPs that do not explain very much of the heritability that can be really valuably informative for trait biology. In the same way, I mean, I don't know if we should be disappointed that we're only getting 13% of the heritability, or we, or we could sort of, on the other hand, say, well, even if we're not explaining very much of the heritability, maybe still there's some interesting biology here. Fascinating.